This is a study called A Life-Changing Connection to Christ in Our World. A Life-Changing Connection to Christ in Our World. And this is a study that we're going to go through for the 40 days of Lent. The 40 days of Lent start today on Ash Wednesday, and they go all the way through till, till Easter Sunday. Now, it's the Monday through Saturday of Lent. So it's Monday through Saturday. It does not include Sundays of Lent, but the, the Mondays through Saturday of Lent are what we are studying. And it's called a life-changing connection. And it's to, just to get into this and to set the stage of this, what I'd like to do is simply to take a look at the mission and the vision of our congregation. And uh, so let's just take a moment to look at the mission and vision of our congregation. Um, the, the mission of our, of our congregation is to make loving disciples. And we are going to spend a little time talking about what it means to be a loving disciple. And we'll be doing that later on in our study. But basically, when Jesus came to this earth, he called 12 men and uh, molded them and shaped them and turned them into loving into disciples just like he was. And we're going to spend a little bit of time later on in talking about that. But Jesus spent time with his disciples looking at that. And then the vision of our church is this, to be a life-changing connection to Christ in our world. And if you'll notice, the name of this study is a life-changing connection. Our desire and hope and prayer as a congregation that as we move about into our community and spend time in the world around us, that we would connect people to God and that they would have a life-changing connection or strengthen a life-changing connection to Christ in this world. That is truly what we're praying for, that the mission and our vision of our church is to make loving disciples and to be a life-changing connection to Christ in our world. Now, we're going to spend some more time looking at that later on, but I just wanted to point that out. And as we start into this, I'd like to take a look at a story from Luke chapter 4. And it is the story of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. And it goes like this. So Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. So in Luke uh, and the other Gospels, Jesus goes into the river Jordan and he's baptized. The Spirit of, of God descends on him like a dove, and then a voice from heaven comes out and says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then from there, Jesus immediately goes into the wilderness to spend 40, 40 days with God. Now, there have been other people in the, in the scriptures that have done this. Moses spent 40 days in the wilderness. Elijah spent 40 days in the wilderness. But God goes and spends 40 days in the wilderness. What did he do for 40 days in the wilderness? Well, it says here he was tempted. But we also know that he fasted. And fasting is a great thing that can be done. And I highly encourage others people to consider fasting. There's a lot of, I fast a lot and there's an incredible amount of blessing that comes from fasting. But I believe that Jesus simply spent time with God. Jesus went out into the wilderness to spend time with God. And while he was there, the, 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 whole, the devil came and he tempted him. He said, if you're the son of God, tell this stone to be bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. So Jesus fought those temptations in the wilderness by using God's word. Because when you are alone with God and in the presence of God, there are many things that you can do to, be, to resist the temptation. You can fast. You can simply be in the presence of God and let God fill you with, with his love and his joy and his peace. Or you can read God's word and spend time studying God's word, inwardly digesting God's word, and then you can use God's word as a sword to help you fight the battles of life. But the important thing is simply going out into the wilderness and spending time with God. So this 40 days that we're going to spend prior to Easter for our congregation is the time when I would like us to spend time with God, to listen to God's word, to understand what God has called us to be as a congregation, and then to reflect on that and to be in prayer on that. If you want to, you're more than welcome to fast on that and let God fill you 
uh, with more of him and less of, than, uh, of us so that we can do the things that God's called us to do. The story goes on. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to them, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. And if you worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil took him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. And then Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. And he was teaching in their synagogues. And everyone praised him. So, what are the lessons from this? That Jesus went out into the wilderness. But why did he go out into the wilderness? Well, obviously, he was just filled with the Holy Spirit. And so he went out of the wilderness to spend time with God, to, to be fed by God, to be tempted by God, in which he used the power of God's word to fight back against those temptations. But the other thing that Jesus did, in my opinion, is that he went out into the wilderness to rest, to prepare, to spend time with God in the wilderness, to simply prepare for what he was about to do. Because after this, then Jesus begins his public ministry. He goes and calls his disciples. He travels all around Galilee and everywhere. He heals people. He preaches. He talks. And he takes 12 men who were completely unprepared for anything, and he molds them and he shapes them into disciples of Jesus. He basically turns these men into little mini clones of Jesus. But before he does that, he goes out into the wilderness to pray and to rest and to spend time with God and to be tempted. But the temptation only lasted a little bit. For the most part, I mean, of the 40 days he was out in the wilderness, he was basically being filled with God. There's a plant here in Arizona. I think it's called a century plant, and it blooms. And when it blooms, it just shoots up out in the air. As a matter of fact, if you watch it, you almost can see it grow. It, it, it blooms so much. But it spends a lot of time in preparation for that by getting and storing sugar in the root system. And it is not able to bloom until it gets that sugar stored in the root system. And I believe the same thing is true for Jesus, that he was in the wilderness kind of filling his root system with sugar and energy so that he could come out of that, being able to do what God had called him to do. There's another verse from scripture I want to take a look at, and it's this from John 15, where Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. The reason why I bring up this verse is because our lives— whether or not it's our Christian lives or our work lives, our family lives, the life that God has given to us, that whole entire life is a period of rest and work. If you'll remember when God created the universe, he created for six days and then he rested. And then he continued to hold the earth in his hands. And if you look at various people in scripture, including Jesus, there's a period of time 
where we're abiding in God and letting God fill us and letting God pour himself into us. I've used oftentimes fill your bucket. There's times when we do activities in our life that fill us with God's presence or even fill us with energy, put energy in our root ball or whatever. And then there are periods of time when we burst out of that to do what the work that God has called us to do. Here in this particular scripture of Jesus in the wilderness, he spent time resting. And then from that, he moved out into the world to do the work that God had called him to do. Now, there were other times where he rested. There were other times that he did work. But this idea of Rest and work is a balance. And if you look at this scripture, Jesus is the vine. He who abides in me will bear much fruit. So there's a period of time when we're abiding in Jesus, where God is pruning us and teaching us and figuring out how he wants to call us and shape us. And then there's time where we burst forth from there to bear fruit. So my prayer for all of us in our lives not only in our, in our Christian walk with Jesus, but our walk in the world, our walk in our work, our walk in our family, is that we spend some time abiding with Jesus, that we spend some time in rest. So many times in our world, we go, 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 go until we're drop dead exhausted. And then we rest physically because that's all we can do And then we wake up in the morning again and we go, 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 go until we drop dead exhausted again at the end of the day. That is not the life that Jesus has called us to. God has called us to more of a balanced life. And maybe it's even helpful to think of just simply spending time and abiding with God away from the busyness of life, away from the stress and the structure of life, That when we go to God in prayer, when we go to God in his presence, when we go to God in his word, that those times that we abide with God, that we put the worries and the stress and everything of the world away from us and simply spend time in the presence of God with his word and prayer just in his presence and to let him start filling us with the things that he wants to fill us, to abide in him. He is the vine, we are the branches, and that life force comes into our branches and comes into us those times that we abide in him. And we have to, as a church, we have to find the time in our lives to simply step back and let God fill us with more of him and less of us. And it's hard. I understand if you're a parent, Uh, If you're a business owner, if you've got a major project due, if you are, um, there are periods in your time when you simply can't find the time to spend time with God. I understand that. Luther once said that he spent three hours a day with God in prayer, uh, but if, uh, and if the worries of the day were more, he would even spend more time. But there were times in his life, even when Luther just wasn't able to get to that presence with God, it had to be a little bit short time. So my prayer to you is that even if it's just a short time to break away from all the pressures and the stress and the worries of this world and simply abide in Jesus. There's a man named Mike Breen who talks about discipleship and he has this graph. It's kind of the rhythm or the balance of life. It, it kind of looks like this. He says there are periods of time where we're resting and there are periods of time that we're working. And we have this pendulum and this pendulum will be over on the rest period when we're resting and it will be over on the west on the work period when it's working. But the worst thing that we can do in our life is to spend our whole entire life and just work, 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 go, 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 go. It simply doesn't work that way. That if we're always in working mode, if we're always in uh, go, 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 go mode, And we're not stopping and simply stepping back and allowing God to abide in us and to rest in us. Then we're not allowing God to fill us with more of him and less less than us. And it is in those moments that we spend time with God where he fills us with more of him and less of the Holy Spirit. Uh, More of him and less of our us. And, And so those things happen when we're working. So... One of the principles that I think we need to 
emphasize in our congregation is that it's not always work, 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 and no rest. My prayer for you is that you, sp- I know that there's so much work that has to be done in our congregation by volunteers, and I understand that, and 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 bless all of you. <laughs> you know, I shouldn't say volunteers, I should say leaders, er- you know, everybody at every level. Um, and God bless you so much. We could not get the things done that we're doing if it wasn't for phenomenally great people in our congregation doing the things that God's called us to do. But I can't come into your life and force you to rest. (laughs) I can't come into your life and say, wait a minute, you're spending way too much time in this or this and this. The only person that can do that is you. And I know that that means that there may be some things that don't get done, and I understand that. But what I have found in my own life is that when I spend even a modicum of time with God, he helps me clarify the things that he does want me to do. And it seems like the working portion of my life becomes more effective and powerful when I am spending a period of time in rest than if I'm go, 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 going. I noticed this when I was working in the business world also. There was a point, I used to call it a point of diminishing returns. If I had a project that was due and I simply couldn't, I'm, sometimes I would just try to work myself in the bone and trying to think if I just if I just work harder or work smarter, whatever, I'm going to get this thing done. And it would never, you know, and sometimes Jennifer's like, are you on engineering time? Are you going to come home for dinner? And it's like, I promise I'm coming home for dinner. Sometimes I just have to put the work away, go home, have dinner, spend time with my kids, enjoy life. And Jennifer's very good about this. (laughs) Enjoy my family, go to bed, pray God's guidance. And when I would wake up in the morning, It was interesting, but many, many times the answer was right before me, and it wasn't there before. So there is healing in spending time in rest. It's amazing how there's healing in spending time of rest. So my prayer for all of us is that we do spend that time in rest. We spend that time abiding with God and His presence and His Spirit to fill us in our life. That truly is what my prayer is for our congregation. Now, I know that there's a lot of things coming up. There's lots of procedures, programs, things that have to be done, and I understand that. And so many times we, as human beings, will think more, okay, what can I do, as opposed to how can I involve other people in this ministry so that I am not as stressed out and doing all the work. Now, my friends, we are going to talk about that a little bit more in this study. So hang tight for that one, because that is also part of this. But suffice it to say for today that our congregation has been given gifts. We've been given land. We've been given a mission. We've been given God's spirit. We've been given great people. And these great people have so much to offer. There's time. There's there's specialty gifts. There's talents. There's, there's treasure. There's... There's everything that God has given us. And we as a church need to come together and understand how is the best way to maximize all the gifts that God has given us so that we can move forward in the mission that he's called us to. And that means not, it means a couple things. First, it means not overworking some people. And it also means activating other people to utilize their gifts also so that they are part of our congregation using their gifts to serve Christ. And it's taken me a long time to wrap my head around this. And I'm, I apologize uh, if this is, you know, that it's taken me as long as it has. But when we first started our congregation 15 years ago, I, I really had no idea what it meant to be a pastor. I did not know what it meant to lead an organization called Christ Within Veil. Vale. I made many, and I continue to make many, many, many mistakes But now I'm older, I'm wiser, I look back and I reflect and I understand what God has called us to do. It's interesting, in 2008, we went through a strategic plan. And in this strategic plan, we hired a consulting company to come and talk to us. And we came up with um, five points that we felt were the DNA of our congregation. One of them was to try to activate people in every level. And we had this this term that someone came up with, like, let's not have any bench sitters. Like, if people are going to be part of our congregation, let's really activate and use them so that even, 
even if you know they're they're lying in a hospital bed, they could at least pray or understand our mission or vision or something that 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 utilizes their gifts for the kingdom of God. And and so the the term we came up with was no bench sitters. And um, so we put this out there on our web page, and we said these are the five things that we believe in, and one of them is no bench sitters. Well, it wasn't 24 hours before a pastor emailed me and yelled at me saying, this is all law, it's no gospel. And you can't say things like no bench sitters and this wrong, 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 wrong. And I really took it to heart because I was a new pastor and I didn't know what God had called us to do. I mean, I figured a group of people coming together saying no bench sitters was, was okay and acceptable, but apparently it wasn't. And I just, so I took it immediately down off the internet and I, you know, I stopped talking about how we should try to utilize people in every aspect. But now that I'm older, I realized he was just a curmudgeonly old guy who didn't know anything about our congregation. The whole, the whole joy of life is serving Christ. Of course, there should be no bench sitters. We as a church should try to activate and engage people at whatever level they can so that they are using their gifts for God. And that can happen in so many different ways. And so we as a church need to figure out how that is. But, but if, if honestly, if, if you're not using your gifts for God's glory, if you just are a bench sitter, then like, why does even God have you on this earth? Right? Um, so we as a church should leverage those resources and try to do them, you know, as much as possible, uh, utilize them as much as possible. So, um, I guess that means that we should have a period of time of rest and a period of time of fruit bearing fruit. There was a uh, a person, not a monk, but a person who spent a lot of time spending with God. She was uh, her, she was known as Julian of Norwich. She lived from 1343 to 1416. This is what she said. She said, "This is the reason why we have no ease of heart or soul, for we are seeking our rest in trivial things." which cannot satisfy, and not seeking to know God, almighty, all wise, all good. He is true rest. It is his will that we should know him and his pleasure that we should rest in him. Nothing less will satisfy us. We shall never cease wanting and longing until we possess him in fullness and joy. And then we shall have no further wants. Meanwhile, his will is that we go on knowing and loving until we are perfected in heaven. May that be our prayer today. Um, I do have an assignment. So every day I would like to have an assignment, a prayer for you. What I'm encouraging you to do is however you can to go uh, in, a, in a private place and in in, if you can find time to spend time with God and just even if it's five minutes or three minutes or whatever, simply spend some time with God asking for his presence and to fill you up with his joy and to do a prayer for that day. And our prayer for today is this. Dear God, as you sent your spirit to Jesus, send your spirit to us. Be with us in these 40 days of rest in you and give us rest for the journey ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so that is uh, today's lesson and today's calling for us. And I really, really appreciate you joining me. And um, I understand that there may have been a a little bit of a glitch there, and I apologize for that. But we will get that fixed, and we will join again tomorrow for the journey. So with that being said, thank you so much for joining me. God's richest blessings. We'll see you later. Take care. Bye.